we're going to be in the book of Luke. Surprise, surprise. We're going to be in the book of Luke, chapter 10. So if you don't have your Bible, there's a Bible in front of you. It's on page 869. We're going to be in verses 38 through 42. And what we are going to focus on this week as we reread this passage. This passage is something, is, is a passage that Martin preached on last week. And what he covered was, he covered what was happening with Martha and Mary. This week, as we read this passage again, what we're going to be focusing on is verse 41 and 42. We're going to re- focus on the response of Jesus. Last week, we learned that really, as, as a disciple of Jesus Christ, Mary was doing what was best, what, was, what, what is lasting. And she was sitting at the feet of Jesus, and she was listening to his word. This week, as we reread this passage, we are going to, we're reading each one of the verses, but we're going to be focusing in on 41 and 42. So before we read, let us go to the Lord and pray. Almighty God, we come this morning as people who are busy, who are overwhelmed with what we see happening in our world today. More locally, Lord, we are overwhelmed with decisions that we have to make, whether it's at work whether it's what school our child will attend in the fall or whether it's college decisions as to which which college will I go to. God, we come to you overwhelmed, busy, needing to hear from you. For God, we are anxious and troubled over much. Help us now to come as your people, to sit at your feet, and to worship by listening attentively to your word. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. This is Luke 10, verses 38 through 42. Hear the word of the Lord. Now, as they went on their way, Jesus entered a village, and a woman named Martha welcomed him into her house. She had a sister called Mary who sat at the Lord's feet and listened to his teaching. But Martha was distracted with much serving, and she went up to him and said, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to serve alone? Tell her then to help me. But the Lord answered her, Martha, Martha, you are anxious and troubled about many things. But one thing is necessary. Mary has chosen the good portion, which will not be taken from her. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Friends, the grass withers and the flowers fade, but the word of our Lord will stand forever. So recently, uh, we had a very expensive car repair that had to be uh, that had to be done to Dylan's car. So we had to replace the transmission. Super not fun and super expensive. And so in the process, there was a much smaller repair that had to be handled. And that was the guy came out and said, hey, your wheel, you need a wheel alignment. I'm like, okay, did they get out of alignment? And he said, well, yes, they're out of alignment alignment, and you need to have them realigned. I was like, okay, great. And so we talked about it for a minute, and of course, me being the person who absolutely knows nothing about cars, just enough to be dangerous, I was looking up, what does that actually mean? I hear that all the time, but what does that mean? And of course, for, for some of you, this, you know exactly what it means. But for me, what I learned was the car, when it's made, is perfectly aligned. The wheels, the angles are perfectly aligned. And then, over time, as you drive the car, you hit bumps, or things. You hit potholes, and those tires bump into those potholes. And if you're from Memphis, potholes are deep, and they're like two feet. And they they get repaired with steel plates, and they they really just throw the car off the alignment of the car off. And so you have to get the wheels aligned. And if you don't do that, it causes stress on the larger parts of the vehicle. 
So you and I, in the lives that we lead from day to day, we have life circumstances that happen. We have relationships with family and others. We have demands at school. We have demands at work. We have family members who are sick. We have loved ones who have passed away. And there is a realignment that needs to happen. We have busy schedules. We have athletic events. We have games. We have practices. We have recitals. We have plays. We have all this thing, all of these things going on in our lives. And what I truly believe that we need is a complete realignment. We need a realignment to remember what is our top priority. Because if we identify what our top priority is, it will cultivate a faith that lasts in you, in me, and for those of us that have children, it will cultivate a faith that lasts past college in them. And so for us to do that, for, the, for us to cultivate a faith that lasts not just in our children, but in ourselves, as parents, as grandparents, as adults, as singles, as married, whoever you are, to cultivate a faith that lasts, there's three things that come out of this text. One, we must sit at the feet of Jesus and listen to him regularly. Two, we must align our purpose and daily living with his desires. And three, we must choose what is best. So that first thing, if we're going to cultivate a lasting faith in a busy world, the first thing that we have to be committed to doing is sitting at his feet and listening to him regularly. Now what's happening to this text, in this text, as kind of a quick review, is you have Martha and you have Mary and you have Jesus. And you have Jesus coming into her house and Martha is extremely busy. She's busy with preparations, but she's, just not, she's not just busy doing random things. She's actually preparing for the Feast of Tabernacles. This is an important feast, and she's preparing for everything that goes along with that feast. And then she just so happens to have the Son of God visiting her. And so the whole busyness thing is ratcheted up because it is, it is a celebration and then there's this guest of honor that is in her house and they, Mar Martha and Mary, they want to honor him. And so the best way that they can figure out that they can honor him is Martha serves and Mary sits. Martha serves and continues to serve even when Jesus comes in and Mary is sitting at the feet of Jesus. But here's the thing, when you get down into verse 41 and you begin to look at the answer of Jesus, before you even get to Jesus' words, what I love that Luke has done is he has taken three words and he has completely redirected our thinking to what is primary. It is not about Martha. It is not about her serving. It is not about Mary. And it's not about us. Verse 41 starts with, but the Lord. Luke redirects our thinking to say, look, Martha and Mary are related. They're sisters. Lazarus is their brother. Jesus is there. The, the most important relationship that you can have in your life, that you can make a priority, is not your family relationship, but the relationship with your Father in heaven. That is the most important, that is the primary relationship that we must have in our lives. And Luke redirects our thinking by saying, but the Lord Colossians 1, 15 through 18, Paul describes Christ in these ways. He is the image of the invisible God. He is the firstborn of all creation. He is the head of the body, the church. 
He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. Paul is saying, look, Jesus is the Lord of creation. He is the head of the church, and he is preeminent. Simply put, he's to be first in everything, over everything. Mary realizes that the best way for her to honor or worship Jesus Christ, the Son of God, is to be sitting at his feet, listening to him speak, their faces locked, their eyes locked. And in that moment, she is saying this, every other relationship and every other obligation I have is second to this relationship. When she sits at his feet, that is what she's communicating. There's a commentator by uh, the name of Warren Wearsby. I will mess up that name three times. Warren Re- Weers- see, there you go. Warren Wearsby, in Luke 10, on his commentary in Luke 10, he says this. He says, verses 1 through 24 is about the 72 who are sent out. They are ambassadors for Christ. They represent him. They represent his mission as they go out and proclaim the truth. Then 25 through 37 is the Good Samaritan. And we saw that two weeks ago. We we saw how the Good Samaritan communicates how to be a neighbor. But then this passage that we're in right now, Warren Wearsby says these words, and these are so, these are so good. Before we go and represent Christ as his ambassadors, before we go and are a neighbor and serving in the name of Christ, we must first be worshipers of Christ. He is to be first. We must get that vertical relationship first and then the horizontal relationships afterward. You see it in Deuteronomy 6. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and might, and then you love others as yourself. You see it in the Ten Commandments. Ten command, the, the, the first four are about our relationship with God, and the rest are about our relationship with others. You see this idea that he is to be our, primar- our, our primary relationship It's about him. We must first be worshipers of Christ. But there's something else. Not only is he to be our primary relationship, he is also to be our true authority. And this is is so critical. You see, the reason Martha was so anxious and out of shape is because of the preparations for this week, the preparations for this meal. And she was anxious because of what tradition tells her this should be. She was anxious because of what happens if it's not perfect? What happens if it's not right? What are other people going to think? What are other people going to say? And yet Mary is sitting before Christ, the one who has authority over all things. And if I'm, if I'm going to be real with myself and real with you, this idea of being so concerned about what other people think that it alters your decisions, that is something that I have always struggled with. And we call it people-pleasing. But we have to remember that the authority of what other people think does not have authority over who Christ is and what he says. And I am, when I am having that struggle, I am comforted when I open Matthew 3.17 and I hear the words that God says to Jesus Christ after his baptism. This is my son, whom I love. With him I am well pleased. The words of Jesus Christ must have the authority over what other people say, what other people think, what we tell ourselves in our head. Jesus Christ, Son of God, His words must be our true authority. And in this, He tells her, you're anxious about so much. When Dylan and I were raising our girls, we, we, you know, started really early and 
And as we, we learned how to raise them and as they were growing up, we made Sunday a priority. And then sports came into the picture. And we had, we had three soccer players and one lacrosse player. And so soccer was huge in our house for so many years. And one of our daughters was, was really, she loved it so much, she wanted to play club sports. She wanted to be involved in tournaments. She wanted to do all those things. And we kind of entered into that first year blindly. We had no idea the commitment that it was going to be. But then that second year where she came back and said, hey, I want to, I want to try out for the team again. I want to play on this team. And there's tournaments and all this stuff. And I, I said, okay, great. And then Dylan and I looked at her and said, well, here's what you're going to do. You're going to go to your coach before tryouts. And you're going to tell him, I really want to play. I'm here to try out. On Sundays, I will not be here if the game is during worship. I simply won't do it. Now, did we do that perfectly? Absolutely not. Were there weeks that we failed? Yes. But we did that because we wanted to communicate to each one of our children that our primary authority and our most important relationship is with the Lord Jesus Christ, not the coach on our team. His word does not rule. Christ's word rules. So no matter who you are, no matter whether you are a parent or an adult, or whether you are a child, the number one thing is are you sitting at Jesus' feet? Are you listening to his word? Are you making that a regular rhythm of your week and of your year? Not just here, but in your home. So what can we do? What can we do as, as parents if we want our kids to have lasting faith, what can we do with our kids? How do we, how do we make that work? I'm going to bring up three things, and, and I'm going to move through them rather quickly. But here's, here's three things that, that you should be thinking about. And, and the, the data is out that, that these things will have a significant influence on your children and even on us as believers cultivating a faith that lasts. Number one is worshiping together in church. It's one of the strongest factors to cultivating a faith that lasts. We've already talked about that one. Conversations. Conversations are next. What conversations are you having at home? There's a researcher by the name of Christian Smith, and he said that a Christian's home that were, that were, that were kind of part of this data 7% of Christian homes were having conversations about faith at home. 7%. What are the conversations that are happening in your homes? Are they, do they, do they talk about faith? One way you can start is, what did you learn at Sunday school today? And whatever you learned at Sunday school today, uh, how, how would it work out for you on your athletic field, at school, at work, wherever it is, are you having conversations at home that are faith-oriented? Thirdly is this, connecting our kids and ourselves to communities where faith in Christ is central and living it, living it out is happening. Living, finding ourselves in faith communities where we Know the word of God is going to be taught and it's going to be lived out well. This is a faith community, this church. FPC Youth Group is a community. Your Sunday school classes, the children's ministry, all these individual places are places where faith in Christ will be discussed and is being lived out. You and I, we have to be connected to those if we want to cultivate faith that lasts. But here's the other thing. 
It's not just sitting at the feet of Jesus. It's not just listening to him regularly. There is this. You've got to do something with, with what you hear. You have to align our, your purpose. We have to align our purpose and, and desires with his desire. We must align our purpose and daily living with his desire. And here's the thing. I've put in the outline two things. Gospel simplicity and a missional purpose. The gospel simplicity is this. Jesus looks at Martha and says one thing is necessary. One thing. That one thing is sitting at the feet of Jesus Christ. Listening to his word and then living it out. That's the one thing. But here's the thing. There may be some of you in here that have no relationship with Jesus Christ. And then the one thing that is necessary for you is that you understand that without Christ, we are completely sinful and unable to save ourselves. And we need a savior. That's the one thing that's needed. For those of you who have not put your faith and trust in Christ, the one thing needed for you is that you need a savior because we are all sinners. But if you are a follower of Christ, if you have put your faith and trust in Christ, then here's the thing. We must be growing in our relationship with him. So the one thing that's necessary is sitting at his feet. This idea of one thing is so important because it's all throughout scripture. We've already talked about Deuteronomy 6. But in Matthew 6, Jesus says, no, you, you can't have two masters. No one can have two masters. Why? Why? Because your heart can't be devoted to two things fully. There's this idea of oneness in John 17 and the high priestly prayer from Jesus where he's saying, look, I want you to be one with, with the Father as Jesus and the Father are one with each other. We want unity. We want oneness. He wants us to be one with him in a relationship with him. So the question is, is if Jesus desires his, us to be in a relationship with him, one-on-one, -on -one, how do we make that happen in our daily lives? How do we carve out, out of the busy schedules that we have, how do we carve out that time and make that time to spend with him? There's a great book called The Three Big Questions for a Frantic Family by Patrick Lencioni. And he writes this as the current state of families, and some of you may identify with this. Kids are being shuttled from school to soccer to ballet to baseball to piano, lesson, piano lessons to birthday parties to counselors, tutors, athletic trainers, and are not turning out the way their parents want. Parents who are doing all that shuttling and working and cooking and cleansing and socializing and exercising are not feeling fulfilled. They're looking at one another and saying, is this inevitable? Is this how it's supposed to be? And when they see everyone scattered and stressed like they are, they conclude that yes, it is. But the author of the book says this. He says, I'm here to say that it's not supposed to be this way. Yes, life should be busy and demanding at times, but it also should be lived out with a sense of purpose and sanity that allows us to be the people that God designed us to be. And I don't think he designed us to be perpetually tired and stressed out. So the questions that he asks are these. He says, what are your core values? And anyone can, anyone can answer these questions. This is not just for families. Anyone can say, what, what is my core value? What do I want the most? What do I value the most? For example, is it standing up for what is right? Or is it worshiping the Lord your God? Are those the values that you have? Because when you ask the question, what are my core values? It leads to the next question, what is my top priority? And for many of us today, our top priority is one of three. Happiness, successfulness, or success, and then being moral. A lot of those goals we have for our kids Happy, successful, moral. We want them 
to be successful academically, athletically. We want them to be in the right crowd, to be popular, to choose the right, to make the right decisions, to go to the right college, to go to the right job, so they can have a family and start the cycle all over again. My question is, is what is your top priority? Because the kingdom of God is nowhere in those three. A pastor friend of ours said that he asked his, his kids this question. He asked his kids, what, is the top, what do you think is the top priority of my life? What do you think is the top priority of our family? And as a pastor, he, was, he had a certain expectation. And the answers that were given included nothing about God. Nothing about God. For all of us in this room, if you look back at the last six months, what would you say is your top priority? Would it include anything about growing in your relationship with the Lord? For many of you in this room, it might. What about families? What about if you, if you ask your kids that question? I would challenge you today to do that when you leave. Ask them, what do, you, what do you think is our top priority as parents? And see what they say. Is your top priority growing in your relationship with the Lord? Are you willing to re-examine what you value most to ensure that the rela- your relationship with the Lord is primary? I want you to listen to these questions because they're really important. How do I make more time for God and get rid of distractions? How do I move from a lukewarm faith? How do I balance everything I'm doing with godly peace? How can I be in the word each day? How can I become more forgiving? What does heaven look like? How should our faith look in everyday life? How can I grow in my faith in a way that others see Jesus in me? Friends, those are not questions from a book. Those are questions from the children of this church. There is a hunger and a desire in the children of this church to know the Lord Jesus Christ. Is that your top priority? I plead with you to make Sunday morning worship and your time during the week, spend it with him. The last question that Lencioni asks is simply this, what do I do with all this data? What do I do with the answers to this question? Jesus' response in verse 42 to Martha is, Mary has chosen the good portion. And that word good actually just means excellent. It's a, it's a comparative word where Jesus is basically saying, look, out of all the, thing, out of all the things that she could be doing, out of all the places that she could be, she has chosen to sit at the feet of Jesus Christ and listen to his word. She has chosen what is best. There's an author by the name of Lisa Turkhurst who wrote a book called The Best Yes. And in the first chapter of this book, she is extremely honest with her love to please people by always saying yes when somebody needs her. And she says this, the reason she says yes is because she worries about what other people may think about her decisions. She does not want to miss out on opportunities. She does not want to disappoint people or mess up relationships. And she said that her desire to please has caused her to miss out on best yes opportunities. What Mary has done and what Jesus is communicating to Martha is this. What, you're, what Martha's doing is, is not bad. But in this moment, the best yes is to be sitting at the feet of Jesus Christ, listening to his word, locked in to his face. And 
And we can do this by being in worship day after day after day. One of the factors that, that, I, that I left out that's so important of cultivating faith in us and in our families is solid biblical teaching. And the beautiful thing is when you come here every Sunday, the word that you're getting, the message that you're getting is coming straight from the word of God. And we need to connect the solid biblical teaching to what is happening in our world. And that is our job up here and it's happening in Sunday school classes. But here's what I would do. I would plead with you if you come to this worship service and then you leave, or if you go to Sunday school and you leave, and you don't understand how, how did the word that I just hear, heard, how does it connect to where I am in my life? If you can't make that connection, I would ask you before you leave, have a conversation. Or if you don't have time to have that conversation, reach out to one of us during the week and let us help you make that connection. Because it's understanding that a solid biblical teaching and connecting that to where we are in our world, it helps cultivate that faith that lasts so that we can choose what is best. I'm gonna end with this. I want you to spend just a few, just a few seconds thinking with me. I want you to think about this. Jesus came to earth as the son of God. He was fully man and is fully God. He knows our pain, he feels our pain, he understands everything, every human emotion and every human pain that we've ever had, he gets it, because he's fully human and fully God. So in that last week before he died, he was beaten, he was betrayed, he was bloodied, he was made fun of, he was bullied, and then he had nails driven through his hands and his feet. And he was hung on a cross. As he hung on that cross for those hours of excruciating pain. Pain that you and I, I hope we never know. But as he hung on that cross, at any moment, being fully God, he could have stepped down. But he made the choice to choose what was best. Not because of his position, not because he wanted power, not because he wanted people to like him, but because, because he had you and me in mind. Aren't we thankful beyond words? that Jesus Christ was not too busy to hang on that cross. He wasn't too busy with other things as he focused on the single purpose that involved you and me, that we would have life we hope you enjoyed this sermon from First Presbyterian Church in Starkville, Mississippi. If you want to find out more about our church and our ministries, please visit fpcstarkville.org. If you'd like someone to reach out to you and uh, maybe grab coffee or lunch to get to know us a little bit better, you can go to fpcstarkville.org connect and fill out the form there. And if you like what you're doing and want to see more, uh, go to fpcstarkville.org give to give.